In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Fairly positive, all of the eyes of the uh, D.C. metro area sports fans that were not distracted by a horse race yesterday or whether the Caps were able to uh, uh, elude elimination from the playoffs were squarely focused on Ellicott City, Maryland for the U-10 soccer game between Ellicott City and our own uh, Fakir uh, United team. So, uh, certainly that's where my focus was as Laura Lee and I drove uh, yesterday morning through the rain for about an hour and 45 minutes to Ellicott City for, for our soccer game. And uh, I say ours because the parents are a little bit more involved than some of the players sometimes. Uh, <laughs> um, and sometimes it feels like uh, the Caps game is taking back seat to the uh, under 10 soccer game. Uh, but I had a lot of time to think about my sermon and, uh, uh, in the drive there, and uh, not much was coming to me. But as I was watching the game, I was sort of thinking about what it means uh, uh, to have Jesus as our good shepherd. Uh, and there was a moment where it became clear that one of these two illustrations might be a little bit about what it's like to be the good shepherd or to understand who the Good Shepherd is. So a little background into this exciting game, and it really was actually a very exciting game. Uh, the other team took a one nothing lead into halftime. Uh, then they came out really early in the second half and, and doubled that. Uh, so we were down 2 nothing. All hope looked lost. Uh, uh, but this uh, brave band of, of young uh, girls uh, rallied back. Two quick scores, tied it at two. Uh, the game is, is, is winding down. And then uh, a fast break elicits a third goal from our opponent. Uh, all hope looks lost yet again. Uh, and, and an amazing shot by our team ties it at three. Uh, all the parents are looking at their watch to see when this game uh, was going to end and whether we'd still get to Gold Cup or not. Um, <laughs> And right as we were convinced it was going to end in a very satisfying three-all tie, one of our players hand, hands the ball uh, inside the penalty box. And they have a penalty kick, which seems like for the win. And I um, will tell you that my daughter was the goalkeeper. And not much uh, <laughs> induces anxiety in a parent, especially when you look left and you see the other overly invested parents. You look right, you see the other overly invested parents. <laughs> And you think, we're not getting out of here if, if, if we don't stop this. We now, again. Uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking, nobody is going to remember the girl that touched the ball in the middle of the penalty box, or all the missed shots that happened before, or all the great saves that, that kept the score at 3 all right now. They're just going to remember the ball going in the goal as everybody drives all the way back through the rain an hour and 45 minutes, misses goal cup, uh, you know, and, and that the score was 4-3. And I'm looking at the uh, setup as they're getting ready for the penalty kick. And uh, if you know anything about soccer, 90% of the time, the penalty kick is effective because the goal is six times larger than it needs to be, especially when you look at the proportions compared to my daughter. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, there is no way she can cover that much land. <laughs> and every fiber of my being wanted to run out on the field and jump in front of it or protect the other half of the goal and say, you take that side, I'll take this yeah. side. <laughs> Or just run off with the ball and see if they catch me. That's... So there we stand. And it seemed like 30, 45 minutes. Uh, and I thought, please, Lord, please let, let her save this shot. Let her save this shot. Um, and he, she steps up to the other opponent, steps up to the, uh, to the ball, and kicks it with all of her might. And I'm sure you saw in Sports Center what happened. <laughs> If you want to know exactly what happened, you'll have to ask my daughter. Uh, uh, that moment ended well, but there was maybe a couple more extra minutes of, uh, of, of, of extra time that didn't end up so, so well for us. But she did stop the penalty kick. Um, and, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I had a lot to do with it, so thank you very much. Uh, but I started to think of these two images. Uh, the, uh, father with the sweat pouring down his head, uh, wanting more than anything to intervene uh, and, and taking every ounce of intentionality and in directing it towards uh, this uh, beloved daughter of mine, uh, or the image of the goalkeeper keeping all those bad things out of the back of the net, uh, diving left, diving right, uh, uh, protecting us from everything. And I think if you ask me when I was 
uh, 18 years old, what my understanding of Jesus as my shepherd, what I heard when I read the 23rd Psalm, it was a lot like the goalkeeper. So uh, you all who are getting ready to head out into the world, listen uh, to this. Uh, the rest of you, go ahead and listen anyway. That's it. Uh, but, but I was pretty well convinced that, uh, that Jesus was going to take excellent care of me. And no matter what happened, uh, Jesus was going to pull me from danger uh, and make everything okay. Uh, and I think that the capacity of, of God is certainly, uh, is certainly uh, to be able to do that. But I think one of the hardest things uh, to, is to love somebody enough uh, to let them fail, to let them do all of the things that we read in that collect, uh, to let the ball sometimes go into the back of the net. Um, and I think uh, we think of Jesus stopping all of the bad things and we forget all of the play that took place before and after. Uh, and we only remember that uh, that ball went into the back of the goal, whether that ball is, uh, is sickness, whether that ball is disappointment, whether it's a failed grade or uh, not knowing what I want to do when I grow up or uh, something happening to somebody we love or a, a broken relationship. Every ball that ends up in the back of the goal is a failure of that goalkeeper, Jesus, uh, from being the shepherd we thought Jesus was supposed to be. But that's not the way that Jesus is. Um, and I think that sometimes maybe the illustration of that parent on the sidelines uh, who wants more than anything to jump on the field but loves enough uh, to let that child uh, make their own play, to miss their own play, uh, but to play the game. That may be a more accurate description of what it is to have Jesus as our shepherd. I tried to explain uh, why Jesus might use the image of a shepherd to the third grade class uh, a week or so, uh, I think a week ago, when I was uh, talking about how, why Jesus taught in parables. And I said, you know, uh, given that they lived 2,000 years ago, given that it was a farming culture, uh, why do you think Jesus uh, used the image of shepherds and sheep? And they uh, answered, well, did Jesus like sheep? Or, you know, because uh, you know, it's in the stained glass window. And, uh, and I had to explain that, you know, shepherding was pretty popular back then. It was a, it was a way of life. It was something that uh, you couldn't have gotten very far in life without uh, seeing uh, uh, a shepherds taking care of their sheep. Uh, and it was probably one that was within, uh, within view shed of where Jesus was, was talking. Um, and uh, uh, one of the amazing things uh, that occurred last year, right actually uh, as we speak this, this week, uh, was when I was in Jerusalem, I got to uh, actually see shepherds that looked like they could have been transported in time uh, in the same outfits, uh, 2,000 years, uh, to uh, these rocky mountains in uh, Jerusalem. And I realized that it's not the picture that's in our, our, our children's Bible with lush green uh, 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 pastures. Um, this is rocky, uh, crevicey, uh, uh, dry, uh, uh, with very little vegetation. Uh, uh, land, and you can understand a little bit more about what a shepherd would have to do uh, to be able to take care of a sheep when you see the terrain that uh, that, that would all take place on. Um, but going back to that, the third graders uh, uh, finally concluded that it was because they don't have uh, sheep in their lives now that they don't quite understand all of the elements of the parable, although they shared with me every encounter they ever had with sheep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we did decide that it was a more relevant uh, analogy then than it would be today and that Jesus might use something different to explain the story. Uh, so let's just educate us a little bit on what it would have been like. So picture that terrain I just described. Uh, and you don't eat in the, uh, in the pen. I mean, the pen is uh, to keep you safe and secure. Uh, uh, you, but you have to go pretty far and wide to, uh, uh, to find pasture, as it says in the, in, in the, in the gospel reading. Uh, and the shepherd is there not only to keep you safe in the pen at night, uh, but also to lead you to places where you can find food. Uh, and so uh, at the end of the day, the, the shepherd takes his sheep uh, and puts it in the, uh, the pen. The pen is basically uh, a stone wall that, uh, that completes itself uh, in about three and a half sides and leaves an opening in the middle. And uh, uh, for efficiency, several uh, uh, shepherds would use the same pen uh, and they would sleep across the front uh, to protect the sheep uh, from any animals that might come in. Uh, and so um, uh, if a bandit were to come from, uh, it would be probably easier to come from the backside and, 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 and try to steal a, a sheep from, uh, from over the, the wall than it would be to go through the shepherds. Uh, and so that's that part of the analogy of where the bandits would come in. Uh, but one of the other aspects of it is because you have all of these sheep uh, in the same pen, uh, the sheep have to know the voice of the shepherd. And the shepherd has to know the sheep. And I think more than protecting each sheep, uh, this analogy, this image of the shepherd is about intimacy, is about love, uh, about investment, uh, that, that, that Jesus knows each of you by name. 
uh, that Jesus knows you so well uh, that you follow at the sound of his voice. Uh, and uh, this uh, gentleman, the bishop, uh, on Thursday was, was describing, uh, went to seminary, but before that he was like the only person that's ever been to seminary in the last, in the modern era that was a shepherd, literally a shepherd. Uh, maybe before that he was a carpenter, but uh, uh, he was a shepherd <laughs> before he went to, to seminary. Uh, and he describes going back uh, after he graduated from seminary uh, to um, the, the people that owned all of the, the sheep. And he went and he called the name of his, his, his two beloved sheep. Uh, and they went running from the other side of, of, of all of the sheep uh, straight to him. That they, un they still recognized his voice uh, and ran so fully. And, uh, and I think that kind of intimacy, uh, the same kind that you can understand on the sideline for a parent who wants so much uh, to see the success uh, and, and urges uh, their child uh, to be all that they can be, uh, is a little bit more than the, uh, the shepherd that, that keeps bad things from happening all the time. Uh, but we do have that beautiful image of Jesus lying across that opening. And he says, I laid down my life. I became the gate. I became uh, what separated uh, evil, death, and all of the powers uh, that corrupt and destroy uh, from my beloved sheep forever. That doesn't mean bad things aren't going to happen. That means the veil between God uh, and God's people, uh, the, the power of death, all of that has already been taken care of has already been laid down in Jesus giving his life upon the cross. And that image of Jesus as the gate uh, sort of uh, uh, cements that. Uh, but one more thing about that shepherd. The shepherd leads us to the kind of life that God wants us to live. And as you all get ready to walk out these doors to go and, and pursue all of your dreams, remember that God has an incredible dream for you. And God invites you to go out. One of the things in this reading, that word that it says he leads them out, it's not really a word that means leads them out. It's actually uh, the same word uh, that he used when he's casting uh, out demons and the same word that he uses when he casts out the money changers. Uh, Jesus is urging with all of that power uh, that he has uh, for you to come out of that comfortable place, the security of that pen, uh, and go and, and find lushness. Uh, to find the things that truly give life meaning uh, and, and purpose. Uh, that reading from Acts and that beautiful image uh, of people taking care of one another, a breaking bread and that special meal that's been poured out for us together uh, in a way that transforms their hearts and their minds and their bodies uh, to be Christ's hands and feet in the world, in a way that allows our life to have body and meaning uh, beyond the things of this earth. That's what God leads us into. That's what our shepherd, who's standing on the sidelines and walking uh, the pacing the field of life with us, uh, wants so desperately. For us to know that God is there. For us to know that God is leading us out, urging us out to live bigger and broader and more kingdom-filled lives. So for those of you stepping forth, uh, those of you just stepping forth and, uh, and heading home, our shepherd calls us to more than we think possible. Causes us to leave our pen and urges us into more dynamic, more lively, more spirit-filled, more generous, and God-filled life. Amen.